Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual briefing on the 87th Texas Legislative Session in Behavioral Health. I'm Edward Berger, President and CEO of St. David's Foundation, and I'm delighted that you're able to join our foundation and the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute for an important and timely discussion on the actions taken in this past Texas state legislative session and the impact of those actions on mental and behavioral health as well as substance abuse services throughout the Central Texas region. Understanding the policy landscape is critical for all sectors, and that includes philanthropy. When new policies have a significant community benefit, a valuable role for philanthropy is often to ensure that those new policies and services are fully utilized. Public policy only has meaningful impact when it's clearly understood and truly enhances the actual daily lives of those community members who the policy was designed to support. And conversely, when policy decisions create holes in the safety net system, philanthropy along with others often step in in either to, to help provide support for those necessary services or to shine a light on the impact of the ongoing community need with the promise to inspire future change. Thus, philanthropy is often the intermediary between the policy created and the people impacted. And the last year and a half is a shining example that policy matters. We need reliable, culturally responsive, social and medical services that ensure that effective treatment is equally available to all the one in five Texans facing a mental health disorder. The cumulative impact of the pandemic with profoundly unequal economic distribution, along with the longstanding structural inequities have imposed existential hardship. And early data help make that impact real. In the past year, rates of death from drug overdose jumped 33%. Symptoms of depression have increased fourfold. The number of people seriously considering suicide doubled. And the emergency department visits for medical health needs of children have increased by 33%. But that's just the data we have today. In fact, the impact on the behavioral and mental health of children over this past year of isolation is one that should be very concerning to us all. We have no idea of the long-term implications of the pandemic to the social and emotional learning of young people, as well as the physiological consequences uh, to children's brain development. Now, many people have been talking recently about the long-term consequences of the past year in terms of learning and formal education. I'm a math professor. And to be honest with you, I really don't care if someone got a C minus in algebra one last year, or will get that exact same grade in this coming year. Trust me, in all cases, folks will forget as much of the algebra as they're allowed to, and that's a lot. But the negative impact of this past year on their brain development, as well as their cognitive and intellectual growth, can inhibit them and be an unforeseen barrier for the rest of their lives. We all need to be thinking today about what we can do to help individuals overcome the emotional and behavioral consequences of the pandemic tomorrow and long into the future. That's why I'm so glad we're able to come together and learn from the wisdom and insights of our colleagues at the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute as they reflect on how the Texas state legislator has responded to the challenges of mental health during this time and the implications of those responses for Central Texas. I know I'll be actively listening with great interest. Again, I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation and with that, I'm happy to turn over the proceedings to our moderator for today's discussion, Evan Smith. Evan? Ed, thank you so much. It's so good to be with you always and to everybody on this call with us today. It's great to get to be with you, even if we can't be in the same room together. Uh, I am Evan Smith. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune, and we've had the good fortune over the last 12 years to have plenty of news to report. Our business was started for the purpose of providing a reliable, credible source of news and information for Texas about public policy and politics. And while I'd say that every legislative session is interesting, 
and different from the one before and after. There was no legislative session that was more different than the one before and will be more different than the one after than the 2021 session, which had as its run up the pandemic year, the economic downturn, the racial reckoning following the murder of George Floyd, the election and the insurrection. Uh, we knew it was going to be a different session. We knew that the way that the business of the legislature was conducted was going to be different than we had seen before. I don't think we fully appreciated exactly how different it would be. And, you know, we came into the session thinking that the book of business would be much narrower, that there would be a desire on the part of the legislature to do the one thing that they were obligated constitutionally to do, and that is pass a budget in balance and then get out without doing a whole a bunch else. In, in fact, this legislature accomplished a lot, did a lot. Uh, made a lot of people happy and made probably an equal amount of people unhappy. I tweeted on May the 11th that this was the most conservative session that I had seen in my 15 sessions at the Capitol. Uh, I stand by that statement today. Uh, the, the Republican majority in the House and Senate uh, accomplished a, a long list of um, agenda items that in previous sessions with more Republicans in the majority in both the House and the Senate, and with more conservative members in the House and the Senate, they could not have dreamed of accomplishing. That is definitely one big takeaway from this session. A second big takeaway, I think, from this session that you all should know as a run-up to our conversation today, is that with the pandemic and the winter storm, another uh, element of, of uh, what happened over these five months, not anticipated on the day we gaveled in, but obviously something that loomed large for the course of the 140 days, the pandemic and the storm got a lot of attention. It's a question as to whether the legislature in the end did an enormous amount on those uh, items. Um, they certainly did a lot on things like abortion, critical race theory, permitless carry of handguns. They declined again to expand Medicaid. They didn't deal with calls for gambling or for marijuana law reforms. Um, but if you go back and take a look at what they did on the pandemic and what they did on the storm, I legitimately do question whether in fact very much got done. That's something that uh, will be left for the history books to decide and for people like me to be talking about for many months to come. Um, the third item that I'll tell you is that we're going to be fine. Uh, and I think Nelson Jaron, when he comes uh, on with us in a second, is going to talk specifically about the piece related to mental health and healthcare more broadly. But, you know, in the end, this state is a pretty healthy state. It's a pretty resilient state. We will survive this the way we've survived things in the past. And when we come back into the 2023 session, I think we'll have an opportunity to address some of the issues that were left unresolved uh, in, in this one. God knows it was an interesting session we're going to be talking about for some time. And I know we'll get into some of those issues in our conversation uh, in the latter half of this hour. But first, I'm very pleased to welcome Nelson Jaron, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. He has the responsibility of giving you in detail a real briefing on issues that people on this call care about enormously. After Nelson's done, I'm going to get to come back and bring Andy Keller, the President and CEO of the Institute, in, and the three of us will talk about some of the specific things suggested by the work of our legislature and Nelson's briefing. So I'll disappear for a while. Nelson, handing the baton to you. Take it away. Appreciate it. Got the baton. All right. Good morning, everybody. Nelson Jaron here, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm going to put up some slides here. At the onset, I just want to, let's see. So at the onset, I want to tell you that um, as an attendee today, we'll be sending a, a follow-up email afterwards. So we'll have a uh, detailed legislative wrap up about key legislation and appropriations wins related to behavioral health. Uh, that'll be coming later today, just in the interest of time, we're only going to hit on uh, about five of those items, but there's going to be more details coming on. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach back out to us. I think as uh, Evan clearly stated, there was a lot going on this session. It was definitely uh, different than anything I've been a part of. I've been around the legislature for 11 years now, not as long as Evan, but uh, it was completely different. Starting at the beginning with COVID requiring uh, COVID tests for entrance to the Capitol, uh, it just really, beginning a session, generally there's a lot of socialization coming on. There's many groups and things coming through the Capitol to see their members. Uh, that was absent just because of the fears of COVID coming out of the winter. Uh, then in February, of course, we had the winter storm hit. So that took a lot of vacuum out of what we thought was just going to be a COVID response focused session. Everything at that point was on the reliability of our electric grid. Uh, and then the latter half of the session, March, April and May, vaccines were starting to roll out. Things picked up 
quite a bit. And as Evan said, they, they started doing work on a whole bunch of different topics. But the good thing for mental health is that we stayed um, kind of off the radar, moved below the fray, and had a very successful legislative session. I think a lot of people were disappointed in how the session ended um, and didn't get the items that they uh, hope to see accomplished, um, more unfinished business to come and the special session, the first one's gonna be July 8th. Um, but like I said, it was another good session for mental health. So uh, Evan alluded to this as well. Uh, when we were looking at the 87th legislative session last year in the middle of COVID, uh, the first and foremost thing we want to do is make sure that the mental health impacts of COVID were front and center, uh, and the legislature knew that there was mental health impacts that they needed to respond to. Uh, so we published a series of white papers starting in April of last year, and we've been tracking the COVID-related impacts on mental health uh, ever since and sharing that information with legislatures as well as op-eds and doing interviews with newspapers across the country just to make sure that mental health wasn't forgotten about because it's a critical part of our, our recovery and response. Um, but at that time, when we were looking back, um, the previous budget, 2020-2021, because of the downturn from COVID, the comptroller is projecting nearly a $5 billion revenue shortfall just for our current biennium. Um, so everybody was thinking that this could be a, a disastrous session going back to 2011, which was my first session when they came in and had a, about a $27 billion shortfall. Uh, so not only were we expected to not have enough revenue uh, to cover the biennium we're in, uh, we were expecting multi-billion dollar shortfall when the legislature came to write their budget in January. Ultimately, uh, the recovery uh, happened quicker than expected. Uh, a lot of that was thanks to online sales tax collections. We collected, I believe, $1.3 billion in online sales tax collections in 2020, uh, and the economy got back uh, kind of to full force quicker than expected. So ultimately, when the comptroller came uh, in January, he gave the legislature a revised revenue estimate or a biennial revenue estimate for 2022, 2023 uh, that was not as disastrous as expected and something they could definitely work with. So ultimately, uh, again, as Evan said, the only thing the legislature actually has to do, they're constitutionally required to pass a budget. Uh, that, this session, that was Senate Bill 1 by Senator Nelson. She's the chair of Senate Finance. Uh, but the, the budget that was passed by the House and Senate is a little under $250 billion for the next biennium. And that's about the same amount of funding that we left with in 2019. So not a lot of growth in that, but also not a, a big hit and a big shortfall on it and, and cuts. There were some cuts to uh, programs, uh, but overall it wasn't as disastrous as we were expecting. Uh, the 87th legislature overall appropriated more than $8.4 billion for behavioral health. That's spending across 25 different state agencies and that's between Senate Bill 1, the budget, and also House Bill 2, which is the Supplemental Appropriations Bill. That's a budget that come in to backfill gaps in the budget. Um, and this is an increase of roughly 350 to $360 million over what the 86th legislature um, included in their appropriations. So that's definitely a big win and not many people can report that. Um, I see that there's a, a question here. I just want you to know the question and answer is uh, you're free to submit questions. We'll try to get those answered as we go. If it's something relating to my presentation, if it's something that uh, we can get to in the moderated discussion, we'll get to it then. And if we can't, uh, we'll be happy to follow up with an answer uh, after the session if we can't get to it. So uh, the other key thing that we thought last fall, not only was the budget expected to be in bad shape, but just because of the um, impacts of COVID, we thought that the opportunities for legislation would be few and far between. So fewer committee hearings uh, was expected. There was a rumor that the Lieutenant Governor had directed the senators to identify their top roughly three pieces of legislation and focus on those. Um, that being said, that didn't stop members of the House and Senate from filing bills. They filed nearly 7,000 bills for the 87th legislative session. That's only about 300 less than two years ago. Uh, one thing that did change though is generally about 20% or one out of five bills make it through the process. This time that was down to 15.5%. So 1,073 bills made it across the line. Uh, Governor Abbott ended up vetoing 20 of those bills. Now I'm gonna talk about five specific items here. Again, these are things that are gonna be highlighted on our, our wrap up that we send out, but there'll be additional items on that. But these are just key things that um, are important to Central Texas and things that I wanted to focus on and discuss. The first is the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium. This is the consortium that was created through Senate Bill 11 last legislative session. And what it is is a consortium of 12 of our state funded medical schools 
Uh, they were given appropriations for five different initiatives focused on children's mental health. And what I'm gonna do is just talk about two of those initiatives that are really key to the COVID response. The first is the Child Psychiatry Access Network or CPAN. Uh, what CPAN is, I'll show you a map here on the next slide in just a minute, but our 12 medical schools have been broken into regions for the entire state. And any pediatrician or primary care provider in those regions is able to, to dial a 1888 number. And based on where they're calling from, they'll be routed to the hub in the region. Their medical school is available for free for consultation on mild and moderate mental health conditions and referrals for the children that they're seeing in their practices. And so the goal with this is to do what we do with any other health condition and to treat our mild and moderate conditions in primary care and reserve our limited specialist for our most severe cases. Um, they were standing these initiatives up over uh, COVID when it was happening. So I'm happy to report that, that the CPAN was launched in May of last year. We just celebrated the one year anniversary and more than 5,500 providers across the state of Texas have now enrolled in CPAN and they've already completed more than 2,500 consults. So I think that's a big win going forward. We're expecting to see more kids with uh, anxiety and depression coming into primary care practice. Just know that this is a, a service that's there and available to support those primary care practitioners. Uh, the other key thing under the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium is known as TCHAT or the Texas Child Health Access through Telemedicine. And what this is, is again, the medical schools with their 12 regions and their hubs, but they're providing telemedicine and telehealth services into schools. So if an ISD wants to participate in this or independent school district, they can enter into an MOU or a memorandum of understanding with their medical school. And that medical school will then provide with parental consent um, if kids are need, in need of um, brief visitation and consultation, or I'm sorry, not consultation, but brief treatment and stabilization, uh, that's what this is used for. They can also then help to integrate them in the community. So this is roughly two to four visits uh, for schools, kind of the front line of defense on school mental health. And so right now there's about 1.3 million students covered by the MOUs that are already signed. Through this summer, we expect that number to get to 2 million students covered by the time the fall semester kicks off. So we think, again, this is really critical, especially as the kids that have been uh, an online school for this past year are returning to the classrooms in the fall. And so the budget, in order to move the consortium forward, they needed about 20 million additional dollars to maintain level services going forward. Uh, and I'm happy to report that the final budget, Senate Bill 1, did include that increase. So we're able to maintain all five initiatives at fiscal year 2021 levels moving forward. What that means for Central Texas, uh, the two key hubs I'll show you on the next slide here uh, is going to be Dell Medical School that covers Travis County and the surrounding counties, and then Texas A&M Health Science Center that covers Bell County, Williamson County, Brazos County, and those surrounding counties. But those are the two key hubs for the Central Texas region, as you can see on the map here. Uh, between the two of them from the consortium, they're pulling down nearly $20 million over the next biennium to fund those five different initiatives through their hubs. Another key win that we think that the legislature accomplished this session for COVID was again, talking about CPAN and the impacts of COVID and mental health and seeing those present in primary care. Another proven tool, an evidence-based program to do this in primary care is collaborative care. And what this is, is a way to treat physical health and mental health with proper supports in primary care settings. So we're screening, detecting, treating mental illness, just like we do for other health conditions through early intervention. So just like hypertension or diabetes, they're measuring your blood pressure, they're ch you're checking your blood sugar at your primary care practice, this is doing the same thing for mental health. So this diagram at the bottom here explains it, but basically the patient in the middle there, uh, behavioral health care manager would be somebody hired by the primary care practice or health system that's embedded in the clinic uh, their responsibility is the patient to monitor how they're doing and ensure they're getting better. The primary care provider also has a psychiatric consultant that's available either through telemedicine, telehealth, or through just phone. And so they're all working together as a team to make sure that the patient's mental health needs are met. And so the reason that this is a no-brainer, we believe, is uh, it's a huge cost saver. Uh, the reason for that is, of course, if you intervene uh, early and aggressively with a mental health, condition, you're going to save dollars and you're going to treat it more effectively and efficiently. Right now, we wait an average of eight to 10 years before mental health conditions are detected and treated. So this is a way to get on the front side of that. 
The second thing is the physical health component on it. If you have diabetes or asthma or hypertension and you're getting treated by your primary care doctor for that physical health condition, if you have a comorbid anxiety disorder or depression, if you're not treating the anxiety or depression, you're not gonna get better on the physical health side. It's gonna be a lot more expensive and a lot less ineffective to do so. So there's numerous cost studies and control trials out there showing the efficacy of collaborative care, uh, but ultimately it's billions of dollars of savings in Medicare and Medicaid settings because of what I talked about, the early intervention on the mental health side and making treatment for physical health conditions more effective. Uh, the federal government saw that this was a good thing, so they authorized Medicare to reimburse for this in 2017. Most commercial plans came online in 2019 because they also saw the benefit. If you think about an employer plan from a workforce productivity standpoint, uh, if you have an employee or one of their dependents and they're struggling with depression and not getting the mental health treatment they need, uh, your employee is not gonna be as productive at work. So it affects their bottom line. Ultimately, the leg of the stool we were missing with this, we had Medicare, we had commercial, we didn't have Medicaid reimbursement. Medicaid is a partnership between the state and the federal government but it's up to the state to set those benefits. So what Senate Bill 672 by Senator Buckingham did was establish uh, Medicaid reimbursement for collaborative care. And so a big person uh, in health system in the Central Texas region that helped with this this session and, and couldn't have been done without them is Baylor Scott and White. Uh, they've committed to implementing this in all their primary care practices in the next two years. It's already in their uh, three of their practices, Lakeway, Round Rock, and in Fort Worth. Um, by the end of it, when they have this fully ramped up, it's expected to cover 2 million lives just in the Baylor Scott and White health system. The next big win this legislative session was telehealth. So starting with last, uh, you know, last year with the COVID pandemic, of course, there was a premium on not having face-to-face -face interactions to stop the spread of COVID. So our mental health providers, our safety net providers, they had to do a quick about face in order to keep their practices alive. And they had to make a massive shift over to telehealth. Um, the way that COVID really modernized the treatment dynamic is the Health and Human Services Commission in partnership with Governor Abbott, they started issuing a series of waivers, which they were able to do under the public health emergency that existed last year and allow certain reimbursement to happen that wasn't authorized to happen before that. So starting in March of last year, uh, the specific behavioral health services and procedure codes that you see on this screen here, uh, they've been allowed to be reimbursed through telemedicine, telehealth, or telephone audio only. So not even needing a screen, just a phone call to do these type of services. Um, and what we were hoping would happen and what did happen this session is that these would be made permanent. So kind of like margaritas to go, the things that worked well in the COVID pandemic should work well when the pandemic is no longer here. Uh, telemedicine and telehealth and audio only were one of those things. So ultimately House Bill 4, which was a priority of the speaker, uh, Representative Price carried the bill through the finish line. It was an omnibus telemedicine and telehealth bill that made these flexibilities permanent. So behavioral health was just one part of that bill, but they basically took all the COVID flexibilities for healthcare related to telemedicine and made those permanent. So awesome win. Uh, and it's big for rural and underserved areas as well. Uh, I think something nicely that paired with that was another priority on the House side was House Bill 5 by Representative Ashby. It was also a priority on the Senate side. It was just that the House bill was the one that ended up passing. Uh, but House Bill 5 establishes a broadband development office within the comptroller's office, and it charges them to do three things. It charges them with creating a broadband development map, uh, second, to establish a statewide broadband plan. The big issue with that is Texas is currently one of only six states that doesn't have a statewide broadband plan. And there's been lots of funding available from the federal government to expand broadband infrastructure. Texas just hasn't been aligned strategically to do that because we don't have a broadband plan. And then finally, uh, it created a broadband development program. Uh, this is a program that I expect to be funded by federal dollars in an upcoming special session, but ultimately those dollars are there to incentivize the expansion and adoption of broadband. So infrastructure um, installation, as well as getting people to sign up and use broadband. But ultimately, I think we all saw through the pandemic that it really, front and center the importance of having broadband access. Now, working from home is impossible without that. Doing school from home is impossible without it. And receiving our healthcare services, particularly in rural and underserved areas, became a lot easier with this push. So that was one uh, good thing that came out of COVID, I think. Another thing that's been critical to Central Texas, um, I think 
everybody on this call has probably been tracking this closely, but the legislature uh, starting in 2017, uh, they worked on a state hospital system redesign. So our state hospitals are built often in rural areas. They're an 1800s model where people used to go and live their lives out kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, the Austin State Hospital is our oldest state hospital. It was opened in 1861. Uh, it's not in the middle of nowhere anymore. It's right a couple miles north of the capital uh, there. So it was ultimately um, awarded funding in the first $300 million allocated for state, health, state hospital redesign uh, in phase one for planning to build a new state hospital in Austin in partnership with the Dell Medical School. Last legislative session, they appropriated about 60% of the funding for Austin State Hospital for the new hospital to be constructed. So this session, Austin and the delegation came back and needed the remaining state hospital construction dollars. And I'm happy to report that House Bill 2, the supplemental budget, includes $124 million to complete construction of the Austin State Hospital. It also had a different, um, different construction projects funded in there as well. But the one important to Central Texas is Austin State Hospital. There was just a question that came in and the recording is going to be available uh, at request afterwards if you'd like it. So we are recording this and we can distribute to you afterwards. Um, in phase one, I mentioned there was $300 million allocated to construction and planning projects. There's a couple things that are ready to come online from that first phase that are, affect Central Texas. So I wanted to hit those briefly. One is Kerrville State Hospital. There's 70 new max security beds that are coming online in Kerrville. The legislature appropriated about $29 million to open those new beds. Those are people that are uh, incompetent to stand trial, trial are not guilty by reason of insanity, and they've been charged with certain offenses, criminal offenses. And so this will open up beds closer to Austin in order to commit those individuals. And secondly, phase one of the state hospital system redesign included funding for a new state hospital in Houston. Uh, that hospital is going to be known as the John S. Dunn Behavioral Sciences Center. It is going to be ready to open in February, and the legislature appropriated $40 million to open those beds there. The reason I mention that, even though it's in Harris County, Austin State Hospital is currently, their catchment area goes all the way to the Gulf Coast. Galveston County is currently zoned for Austin State Hospital. So with that new state hospital opening in Houston, that's going to allow the state to redraw the catchment area for our state hospitals, and Austin is going to have a more concise catchment area closer to Austin. And then finally, I'm going to briefly hit on the COVID relief funding. Uh, there's been six COVID relief bills passed since March of last year. Uh, there was five passed under President Trump. The last one was the, known as the CARISA. It was a Consolidated Appropriations Act that was passed in late December. And then President Trump signed it on December 27th. Uh, but Today, I'm gonna to focus on the American Rescue Plan Act. This was President Biden's first big act and accomplishment uh, when he became president in January, and it was $1.9 trillion. So it was the biggest package by far, but it's got a couple of key funding streams I want you to be aware of. The first is that that act provides more than $3.5 billion to SAMHSA, which is the federal agency that oversees substance abuse and mental health services. Those dollars are going from SAMHSA straight to our state through the Health and Human Services Commission. HHSC, the Health and Human Services Commission, is then distributing them out to their safety net providers. So our local mental health authorities and our substance use providers that are on the ground are getting a share of those dollars, Texas's share of those dollars, straight out through their existing contracts. Beyond that, the American Rescue Plan Act also included a massive amount of dollars for schools. Nearly $12 billion are going out to were allocated for schools, but $11.2 billion of that are going directly through our K through 12 school districts across the state. These funds are known as ESSER $3, and what, they can, what they're targeted for is any type of COVID response for schools. That can be addressing COVID learning loss. It can also be mental health impacts and supports. So we've been working with a lot of ISDs across the straight to help them uh, across the state to help them strategically think about how they can leverage those dollars to address the mental health needs of their students. Just to give you an example of some of the dollars that are coming down, Austin ISD is receiving nearly $156 million directly through ESSER 3. Uh, Leander ISD up here in Williamson County, where I am, is receiving about $16 million. So if you'd like additional information on ESSER, if you just search TEA for the Texas Education Agency and ESSER, they have a dedicated page to this with more information on um, what, the appropriate, what the appropriations are for each of the ISDs, uh, as well as the guidance around those dollars. There's also nearly $16 billion that the state of Texas is receiving. 
Uh, Governor Abbott has promised to put this on a special session that will coincide with redistricting issues. So either in September or October, the legislature is going to get to weigh in on how to allocate these $16 billion. And then finally, Texas cities and counties are receiving direct payments from the Department of Treasury. So cities that have a population of 50,000 or more are receiving direct payments that will total $3.4 billion. All 254 counties in the state are also getting direct payments, nearly $6 billion. So at the local level, your mayor and city council, at the county level, your county judge and your county commissioners, they're making decisions on how these dollars can be spent. Again, it's broadly defined, but it's responding to the COVID-19 public health emergency is the key thing. Mental health and substance use concerns are definitely up and they can be a way to leverage those dollars. Finally, I'm gonna put in a brief plug here. I'm just, again, this is a short thing. It's, a, it's an hour long, we can only get to so much. But we have our annual Engage and Excel conference coming up in September. It's September 30th through October 1st. It's going to be annual, or it's going to be online this year. We did online last year. It worked out well. Uh, we're planning to be in person together again next year. Uh, but it's going to be a day and a half of talking about mental health um, wins, how you can implement best practices in your community, and learn from other communities and what they're implementing. So its registration is available now. We have early bird pricing through September 3rd. So I encourage you to. Uh, sign up and register. You can just search Engage in Excel and that'll be the top hit for you guys to sign up. We'll also have a link to that when we send out the follow-up from today's. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides here. We're going to transition to the moderated discussion here and visit with Evan's going to be our moderator and bring Andy online here. There I am. Now I'm unmuted. Uh, Nelson, I thought you did a terrific job on that briefing. Thank you. It was fascinating. I pay attention to this stuff all the time, and I still learn stuff from that last half hour. So thank you very much. It is now my pleasure, as Nelson said, to, uh, to welcome uh, Andy Keller, who is the president and CEO of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute and the Linda Perryman Evans Chair. Andy, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Glad um, to be here, I, Evan. Thanks for doing this. Happy to. I, I thought we would begin uh, by talking about the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium. In other words, not starting with 2021 so much as going back to the creation of that uh, uh, in, in previous uh, uh, session. Um, I want to understand the nature of the problem we're trying to solve here. Let me start with you, Andy. Uh, I read the 2021 State of Mental Health in America report. We reported on that at the Tribune, and I saw a number of statistics that alarmed me, at least, about where we are compared to other states. It may be that we don't care where we are compared to other states, that we only care about where we are, right? But that report, among other things, suggested that Texas is 50th out of 51, the 50 states plus DC, in overall access to mental health care, that only one in seven Texas children with major depression received consistent treatment. That's almost half the national average. That the vast majority of kids with mental health disorders don't receive treatment. We like to be first and best at everything in Texas, right? We don't sound like we're first and best at this. Does the Child Mental Health Care Consortium solve the problem? And are we thinking about the problem properly? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Evan. And I think it's important to ground it in those types of reports. Um, but here's the context, right? I think to me, those reports are like ranking the cars in a demolition derby. Yeah. I mean, you know, there is no state that's doing a good job of children's mental health. There's no strategy nationally. If you look at what the federal government's doing, they're still focused on appropriately people with serious mental illness, the adult system, crises, police, which are primarily affecting adults when half of these illnesses begin uh, before age 14 and three quarters begin before your brain's done developing. So we all suck. I mean, so the one in six number you had there, nationally, the number's 20%. So like we're 15%, nationally, it's 20%. There's states that are worse, there's states that are better. Um, that same ranking report, if you look at our overall access to mental health, um, we're ranked 27th, whatever that means. Um, and we went from 38th to 27th in one year, right. which I do, do think shows that we made some investments. So uh, to me, those are useful. But the, the bigger reality for children's mental health is we don't do a good job. We haven't come to terms as with a culture that these are pediatric illnesses. We don't want to think that our children are depressed or anxious or could become uh, suffer psychosis. So what Texas did in 2019 was was actually quite important. Rather than just sort of put a Band-Aid on things, uh, you know, we, we first we had Hurricane Harvey in 2017. You know, we knew something was going to happen about that. Um, but then when we had the Sandy Hook, I mean, not Sandy Hook, when we had the uh, Santa Fe uh, 
trauma, the Santa Fe, you know, murders of those children um, at the high school, those young people, um, you know, the state said, look, this is our youth are in trouble. And they looked at statistics that showed that suicide rates were growing. And so what they did was they said, let's structurally create something that will we can build on over time and let's put it in place now, get it up and running. Um, and, and, and Nelson described it well. We basically are leveraging the power of our 12 state funded medical schools, just like we've done for other diseases. I mean, we, we did it for cancer. We've done it for diabetes. So we've done it for strokes. So now we're doing it for pediatric mental health. And thank, literally thank God that we did because um, we're now in a terrible situation. The original epidemic now, a 50% increase in the number of young uh, girls, adolescent girls and young women going to emergency rooms for suicide in this nation. And that's affecting Texas as bad as anywhere. So a 50% increase in one year. Thank God we have that infrastructure to build on. And, and that's really, and it was a structural shift. It was a matter of let's do business differently and not wait until people show up at a mental health center 10 years later. So Ed Berger, Andy, said at the beginning of this hour that he was as concerned as anything about the, the, the effects of the last year plus on our mental health. I mean, obviously, this public health emergency had many horrible aspects to it. The number of deaths, the number of people who got sick were hospitalized, the economic effects of people being put out of work as a result of the pandemic and the shutdown of the state. We don't talk as much about the mental health piece. I'm not sure that I fully appreciate exactly what the impact on children's mental health was of the last year. Do, do we know yet, Andy, how long will it take for us to actually understand how deep the hole we've dug here is? Yeah, well, we know that we're already in a deep hole. I mean, national stats, the one I just said, I mean, 50% increase among young women, 33% uh, overall increase, uh, one, three times the rate of depression and anxiety being experienced in the culture, which is down from four times the rate historically two months ago. But it's not going to, I mean, here's the, the, there's two big things. Evan. You alluded to one with the number of people we lost. The reality of losing this many people and the children affected by that, the number of black children who lost parents is 50% higher than the number of other children. Uh, the number of Latino Texans in the prime of their lives during their work lives that were lost four times the average number. So we not only have huge numbers of children with their parents and loved ones and aunts and uncles and grandparents impacted, but we also have tremendous disparities. So that's one around grief. The second one is it's sort of like, you know, you go to war, right? And you're up and you're, you're in stress levels. You come home. Most people actually don't develop PTSD during the war. Soldiers who develop PTSD do it when they come home. Um, and if we look at our healthcare workers, uh, since there's a lot of studies that have shown 40% or more of them are suffering post-traumatic stress symptoms. They're operating at a hypervigilant state, which was kind of helpful actually for getting through the pandemic. But now as we wind down, they, parents who were like running home schools, as we get back to normal and realize there actually is not a normal, like the, the normal we thought we left is not here. We're gonna see illness and we, we know what this is like. We've seen hurricanes, we've seen other things. Two to four years, Evan, is what we're looking at for the continued emotional impacts from this to be at an escalated level. And it will start growing now. It right. will be higher next year than it is now. Uh, Nelson, let me bring you into this on the subject of the mental health consortium created, as Andy said, in 2019, and also the good work that the legislature did on mental health this time. As the saying goes, I'm old enough to remember when Speaker Strauss had to appoint a select committee to discuss mental health funding and policy in an interim because the legislature in regular session simply wasn't getting it done. Have we now gotten over the hurdle of the legislature taking this issue seriously enough to create and fund a consortium to put money into state hospital renovations and other priorities that you talked about? Are we now in a place where we can feel reasonably sure that mental health will not just be a one-off issue, but will be a persistent through line in every session to come? For sure. I think it's got broad bipartisan support at this point, and there's more and more members in the House and Senate talking about it. I mean, the impetus for most of these investments in mental health started with the Sandy Hook um, school shooting tragedy. Um, but then the credit to Speaker Strauss for creating a select committee, because what he did, he, he had so many ch people that became future chairmen or young members that gained that expertise yeah. in a variety of different areas. Laura Price, you know, Joe Moody, James White, and they all became chairmen and, and brought their kind of unique perspective to it. Right. Um, and then in the Senate, you've had Senator Nelson's been dragging the state along on this, and she was the chair of the Senate Health and Human 
Senate Health and Human Services Committee, and then now as chair at Senate Finance, she's yeah. championed it. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, things that have set the mental health up for success as far as a, a you know, legislative agenda or legislative session. Speaker Strauss creating the select committee created all the momentum for 2017. 2019 was all about children's mental health, and that was due to the effects of Hurricane Harvey and the Santa Fe school shooting tragedy. And then this session, it was the COVID impacts of it as well. But I think this session was even different. There was more members talking about it that hadn't talked about it before. And I think that's because they heard from so many constituents and people just talking about either on the phone or you know, going back to their communities during COVID and, and people that they didn't expect to have a loved one talk about that or you know lose one of their constituents to suicide, they were bringing that back. So uh, we've had a, a series of events that have the stars have been aligned on mental health, but I think now that there's broad bipartisan support in the health and the Senate and they look to key people that have established track records in this to what do we do next? Help inform yeah. them. Uh, Nelson, I, I was interested. Yeah, Evan, oh, yeah, Evan, can I just add one thing on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, wish just, I mean, I think too that, yeah, just, I think with COVID, like we all think of mental health differently. I mean, we all lived through something where we became much more aware of our mental health and our neighbors and our children. So I think that also has to be factored in. I mean, when I went to my first hearing uh, with the House Appropriations this year, it was just a different tone. I mean, people were talking about this like they were living it. And it, it and I, I think that's also a factor. I mean, the structural things Nelson noted are critical, but I think that's also a thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate you saying that. I do think that the tone is different. And again, that's not likely to go away when the pandemic ultimately reduces, right? I mean, we, we won't see the pandemic completely disappear. But when we get to that after, which, as you suggested, is not going to be the same, Andy, as the before, one thing that is likely to continue is that we'll have a different tone on this. Nelson, let me ask you about something you mentioned in your briefing. This was legislation to implement collaborative care in Medicaid across Texas. Why is this important? How does it affect Central Texas and Texas more broadly, specifically? What difference should we expect to see as a result of this? I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think the key thing is we know that it's a, you know something that's had 80, 90 randomized control trials showing that it works, and we're trying to make this shift of treating mental health and primary care like we do with anything else. We're never going to grow enough specialists or uh, Andy's a psychologist, psychologist, counselors, and everybody to hand this to hand everybody off to. So we have to enable our, our primary care providers and our pediatricians to be able to have the tools necessary to treat those mild and moderate conditions in their office and reserve our specialists. So it's about redesigning the system. Andy's got a good story about uh, his grandfather being detected with a heart attack when he actually had a heart attack, but they've been haranguing him about his cholesterol since his 30s. So it's a monumental shift that we have to make in mental health, but ultimately that's where we have to be. So I'm pleased to also report we were just recently awarded the Lone Star Prize by Lida Hill Foundation, and that's going to help us provide free technical assistance to health systems to implement collaborative care across the state. So yeah. training them, giving them assistance, and then also measurement-based care is a key of that. So we're working with UT Southwestern uh, and people from Harvard on implementing that across the state of Texas. And so it's a, it's a long charging mission, but if we can get some of these uh, big health systems like Better Scott and White reaching 2 million lives, uh, we'll see a change pretty quickly yeah. and we'll, we'll drag the rest of them along with us. So, Andy, you agree this is, a, this is an important step forward on, on health care and specifically mental health care. Yeah, it's a game changer. And, you know, one big reason, too, uh, is, you know, health systems have to look at the entire population. So Medicare started covering this in 2017, and that got the ball rolling. Yeah. Commercial plans added it in over the next couple of years. So by last year, every commercial plan covered it. But a health system isn't going to make a change, particularly a children's health system, because so many children depend on Medicaid until Medicaid is there. So this is the missing piece. We now have every major payer in Texas covering this. And so we can now health systems can start moving forward more aggressively. So it was a game changer, not just for people with Medicaid, but really for every person in the state. So, so the Medicaid piece of this, of course, makes me want to ask you, Andy, about the decision by the legislature this session not to expand Medicaid. There was a push, a bipartisan push, or at least a push that was more bipartisan than what I had seen in previous sessions, to try to access some of those federal dollars. The math from the Bush School at A&M, which I'll note is not UC Berkeley, right? This is not some, you know, Stalinist outpost or liberal outpost. This is actually... Um, uh, the Bush School at A&M said that if we put in 600 million, we get back 5.4 billion, 1.27 million people who are currently without insurance in Texas would have coverage. 5.2 million Texans before the pandemic had no access to coverage. 18.4% 
of our population, double the national average. And as you pointed out earlier in talking about her, Nelson, uh, everyone's talked about this to some degree, the question of racial disparities that surfaced during the pandemic. We know that African-American and Hispanic communities are much more likely to be uninsured than white communities and are much more higher, have a higher likelihood of being uninsured than not just Texans, but Americans by a significant margin. Does the lack of action on Medicaid expansion in this legislature complicate the efforts that you all are, 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 are making on trying to implement things like collaborative care, which rely on the payers to get on board? If you had Medicaid expansion, you'd presumably be able to reach more people, treat more people, right? Yeah, so there's two ways it complicates things, Evan, which, by the way, I love how you frame that, because one thing we're trying to do is to get people to frame this not as expansion or not expansion, which is a tired, old, weary, political battle that only benefits partisans. It doesn't right. benefit Texans yeah. to use the, to talk about expansion or not. What benefits Texans is to talk about math. And you went over the math. Texas 2036 did the math. We did the math. The math is what we should be following. So I love how you frame that. But there's two issues. One is uh, in that sort of tit for tat thing, uh, the, the administration's decision midstream to blow up the waiver, um, which I think some people thought would help Medicaid expansion, maybe it does long term. Uh, it certainly stopped in its tracks some bipartisan efforts to maybe get a right, vote. It was in almost the House too clever by half, right, to do this. When it, yeah. when well, I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, you know, they're, they're they have bigger fish to fry than I do, but I'm just saying the one big problem that that caused was that while we've got a year and a half, 15 months, whatever, to negotiate a solution for uncompensated care, we have three months to fill a $330 million annual gap in federal funding that will begin this October right. because the disrupt component of the waiver expires in October, not next year. So uncompensated care is the big battle. That's the one that's going to drive whatever next solution happens. But there's going to need to be some short-term action. And I don't think the waiver is going to be, I mean, it might be. But, you know, I hope that someone in the administration is thinking about a district extension for a year and that someone at the governor's office is thinking about using some of those federal funds to plug that gap. Otherwise, we're going to be short 330 million bucks, and that's going to affect a lot of Texans. So 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 that's one issue. The second issue is that people with mental illness have issues below the neck. So while the, the waiver had some nice mental health dollars for the brain, those folks are dying from heart disease, COPD. Um, right. diabetes, uh, infectious disease, not just COVID, um, though more risk of COVID. People with mental illness are at 60% higher risk for COVID so, and other infectious diseases. So, so it's, you can't just do this with mental health. You gotta fund the physical health care. Right now, that burden rests on Texas counties, on hospital districts and taxpayers right. who um, really don't have the resources. So let's bring in those. So we're very much in favor of doing the math the right way getting every single federal dollar Texans deserve and moving past this tired discussion about a, a 12 year old, you know, uh, political dispute. So, yeah, so I, that, those are the two big issues from our perspective. Now, Nelson, you know, I hear people at the legislature talk about the 1115 waiver, which Andy is referring to, which the Biden administration pulled for a procedural reason, and now we'll have an opportunity to reapply for the 1115 waiver or Medicaid expansion, when in fact, the reality from a policy standpoint is it's probably both and Nelson not either or, right? Yeah, it's definitely both. So that's the thing that kind of muddies the waters there. I think some people that were really pushing for expansion or coverage expansion, Medicaid expansion, you want to call it, they were um, disappointed when the 1115 waiver got renewed because they thought that that wouldn't make Medicaid expansion as high up on the list, uh, but they were happy when the 1115 waiver got rescinded. Um, and the truth is that it, it's a not either or, it's an and conversation. Yep. Uh, and so the 1115 waiver, uncompensated care is huge for the hospitals. Uh, Andy mentioned the district portion. That district portion just for mental health is $330 million. And those dollars are out of the budget. So a lot of that is local things for crisis, mobile crisis outreach right. teams. Those are things that keep people from coming into the system. And it might look like funny money because it's not actually in the budget that the legislature writes, but that's money that would, you know, but for something getting done between now and September 30th, that's going to be sucked out of the system. So it, it, it has to be both. Even if you have a Medicaid expansion, 1115 waiver, we have to have that for managed care for our state. And there's also a gap, as you know, between what Medicaid reimburses and Medicare yeah. commercial plans. So there's still an uncompensated care component of that waiver regardless.
And the hospitals in this state, and particularly the rural hospitals, as you alluded to, are, are really uh, uh, suffering. I mean, and they were suffering before the pandemic. They're suffering more from the, uh, fr from the effects of the pandemic now. Uh, Nelson, stay with the legislature for me and something else that was in your presentation, and that is the decision to finally take the broadband challenges that we have in this state seriously. I mean, you know, you know how this works. You've been around for a while. The governor does his state of the state speech at the beginning of a session and identifies so-called emergency items. That so-called part is more the case with some items that are not legitimately emergencies than others. But it's hard to argue that broadband hasn't been an emergency in a literal sense in Texas for some time. And what we saw over the last year, whether it was sending your kid to Zoom school or having your kid, as I have a kid at college, doing classes online as opposed to in person and especially accessing healthcare remotely, we really had walked up to the edge of not having a choice but to do this. So do you think that what passed is going to be meaningful? You alluded to HB4 and HB5, and HB4 essentially memorializing the changes that we made, Representative Price and Bill Great. Is HB5 really going to be all that? Are we going to see real action soon? What do you think? Uh, well, I don't think you can develop broadband infrastructure overnight, which is why yeah. it's key that HB4 on the behavioral health side has those audio only provisions. So that's particularly key, as I mentioned, for rural access, underserved access, you know, out in between uh, San Antonio and Austin and, and El Paso, there's not, not much out in between. And as far as broadband infrastructure investments, uh, it's unlikely to start there first. I mean, we have areas that are deserts for broadband in Austin and Dallas. So it's not just a rural issue. There's There's parts, but... I think we saw from the COVID pandemic and what Commissioner Marath had to do with TEA leveraging dollars just to get hotspots and uh, computers out to kids, what those gaps were. That wasn't just uh, kids in, in rural ISDs that had those issues. There was kids in big cities that had to have hotspots. So it's a two-pronged thing. You need the broadband infrastructure, but then you also need people to actually adopt and use that. So is it is it a uh, silver bullet? No, but I'm, I'm happy that we're no, no longer going to be one of the six states in the country that doesn't have a broadband hey. development map. Because of, as I've been tracking these six COVID relief bills and seeing these hundreds of millions of dollars going out for broadband infrastructure, Texas just has been left behind because we haven't been strategic about it. Uh, but one part you of that, that is, that is um, you know, the broadband development program in there, that's just a program without any funding in it in House Bill 5 right now. So is that going to be a game changer? Uh, no, it's not going to be. But I think that there's, with that $16 billion that they're talking about with the federal dollars, uh, many other states have had conversations about using that for broadband. It's not just something in Texas. And I think the legislature is likely to use some of that as a one-time expense to fund that development program. So they'll be able to do loans kind of like we did with SWIFT for water, uh, and pair that with these federal investments to magnify the amount of investment in our infrastructure. Of course, you know there'll be a scrum for those dollars, of course. Everybody yeah. will be fighting for Absolutely. those dollars. Andy, you were going to jump uh, in, then I want to ask you well, a question uh, back in. Yeah, well, I just uh, let's not, I, we shouldn't, I mean, you, you said this, but I just want to emphasize the regulatory piece here is huge. We should be really proud that Texas has pushed this out. This audio only thing is really important. We did it universally across state programs. We need to be able to look beyond, you know, now and hope that other people emulate. We hope the private sector emulates. We also need providers to step up because providers, not all of them like this tele stuff. A lot of them are itching to get back to that nice, cozy office where they can do their therapy. They need to realize that like people deserve choices and most people, right. like the, the folks that have surveyed as 90% plus of people, they like this. They don't like driving to your office. This works just as well. So I, I just think yeah. we did a great thing then. We really need providers now and private insurers to step right. up and match what the state's done. You, you made a good point. You know, I, I recall previous sessions where the conversation around telehealth was that some of the professional groups were opposed to it. Not hearing much opposition after the last year, Andy, right? And I want to go back to Nelson's point on broadband. You know, we make an assumption that this is all about rural. And the reality is, I think the last number I saw was 31% of rural households across Texas don't have reliable access to high-speed broadband. But the fact is, communities of color, not rural, have less access to broadband. If you're poor, regardless of race or geography, you have less access. So telehealth actually has the ability to affect more than just, as Nelson said, that area between Austin, San Antonio and El Paso say. It affects the whole state, right? Uh, yeah, and you know, and this thing, this yeah. works pretty good. Works pretty like, good. Like a lot of people have these things, yeah. And you know, and most people have cell coverage. So you know, this, that's why the audio only is so important. That's why we need to continue pushing the envelope and technological innovation. I mean, chat, texting, there's a lot of things 
that that help a lot. So so it's a, it's an all of the above. Yeah. We need to talk about we need to make broadband more affordable and universal for a lot of reasons, not just mental health. But but this audio thing is pretty important. Uh, Nelson, you mentioned that your first session was 2011, right? You were you were here during the 2011 session first with Capital. Um, I seem to remember that some federal stimulus dollars that were used in that period of time solved problems in the short term, but that ultimately in 2011, we had a shortfall in part because those federal stimulus dollars that we had relied on previously went away. Are you concerned at all that the use of federal funds, even on a one-time basis to solve some of the problems we're talking about today, will themselves create a hole that will need to be filled in subsequent sessions when we don't have the benefit of access to those dollars? Absolutely, at least a cry to fill that hole. I think we've seen with the schools ever since the Obama administration stimulus funding came in. There, there, I don't think there's been a campaign that's gone by that hasn't talked about the cuts uh, to the schools that happened in the 2011 session. So I, I think the members of the legislature, there was so around the ESSER funds for education in particular, um, maybe more on the Senate side than the House side, there was a lot of concern about those dollars and you know there was delays in getting them out. But I think that that concern is big. That's $11.2 billion. So it's a lot more than there was added back in 2009. Right. And that's just one round of ESSER dollars. So they've, they've tried to warn them and say, look, these are one-time expenses. They can be used through September 2024. So you need to be strategic with them and create a plan that spends a little, but also doesn't end with a fiscal cliff at the end of it. So I think that'll be the, you, you said there's gonna be a scrum for the 16 billion the state has, but it's the same thing. I think they're gonna be looking at one-time expenses, yep. uh, something they can use over the next couple of years where they, to the extent they can, you can't control the narrative around it that people don't come back and say, well, you cut my funding. Um, they can only do so much uh, with putting strings attached to it. But I do think that that, I think that caused a lot of issues around the debate for these dollars this session. And I think it'll be, until those dollars are expended, we, we won't know exactly what people are going to say on the back end, but yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a concern. Uh, yeah. But that ahead. being Go said, ahead. that being said though, like we're encouraging schools and local governments to spend those dollars and yeah. to spend them in the hopes that spend them on needs. Cause you know, people need things and you know, we serve, 100, 200, 300,000 people with services over the next two years and goes away. That's not the worst thing in the world. And maybe it shows that we need to make some additional investments. So yeah, I mean, I think the, the state dollars, they need to be wise about that, but local and school, like let's do some stuff. And we're happy to help with that in terms of, you know, where are some opportunities and point to some school districts. They're using those to some counties that are using those a big thing in Dallas today on housing. So I think we do want people to do things that then there will be a need to continue later. So just to say. Yeah, uh, Andy, we're coming to the end of our time here. I want to ask you to make the last uh, observation uh, uh, of our conversation right now, which I appreciated having very much. Uh, Ed Berger said this at the beginning, that philanthropy has been put, as it often is, in the position of stepping up to fill in, speaking of holes, holes created by a lack of will or a lack of wallet on the part of government to solve problems. All of us are from a generation conditioned to believe, or many of us are, that government steps up and solves problems and problems come up. The fact is you all in philanthropy, often have to be that problem solver when government can't or won't do it. So we really have been in the midst of two pandemics. We've been in the COVID-19 pandemic, but we've also had a mental health pandemic that you could argue is second wave, but arguably was a pandemic before the pandemic, right? The mental health problems we have in this country probably rise to that level. What do the people on this call, so many of whom are generous philanthropists, what do they need to do? What can they do to best help us address broadly speaking, behavioral health needs, and more narrowly speaking, those needs in the child and youth population? Yeah, great question. So, um, so this is a once in a lifetime opportunity with these federal funds coming in to the healthcare system to make needed changes. And one thing we've been doing is we've been doing, we've been organized the wrong way in mental health. Sure, we've got a workforce issue, but we have a bigger workforce deployment issue because we have not deployed our workforce, psychologists like me, in primary care and health systems, we're often decided doing private practice psychotherapy, which is an 1875 model. We need to get up into the 21st century. So let's use these one-time funds to make those transitions, make hire the people, get things started up, get the health systems in place. And philanthropy can play a role in there through strategic investments. This Lida Hill grant that we just got is meant to be a catalyst for health systems to spend billions different. So if you can spend $100,000 to change a $20, $100 million funding stream, you should be doing that. And, and this next two years, I mean, that should be the role of philanthropy, we believe is more, I mean, 
we should not be doing things instead of government. Government is can do should be doing more um, in its lane. And there are some things philanthropy needs to do outside, like faith based stuff and other stuff the government can't do. But for the majority, using these strategic opportunities to get the public investment aligned with needs better. And I think nobody's better able to do that than philanthropy. And Texas philanthropy thinks big and, and I think is going to lead the way nationally. I'm super excited about what these next two years are going to show. Okay. Uh, Andy, that's a great answer. And I appreciate so much those thoughts and comments. And so thank you to you. Thank you to Nelson. Thank you to the Mental Health Mayo's Mental Health Policy Institute and to the St. David's Foundation, to Ed Berger and to others there for convening this conversation. Everybody on the call, thank you so much for joining. There's a lot more work to be done and we're going to get at it. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much for joining this briefing. Thank you.